Well, here we are back at the Grassy Knoll, and you're being uh, <coughs> you're going to be listening to this on uh, RemnantRadio.org, PascoRadio.org, and also local uh, radio in the East Pasco County area. That's AM 1610, WDCX. Now, back with us for a third show is uh, the I Man. We call him the Informer. Uh, you can go to the website atgpress.com. And on that page, click on Informer, and you'll hear, uh, uh, well, you'll read a lot about what we're speaking to today. And uh, thanks very much for coming back on again, I man. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <coughs> I enjoy it. Yeah. At least I can get some of the thing out over the airways rather than through uh, the mails. Well, yeah, it's good to do both, uh, by all means. I mean, they both resonate one with the other, but I think you do get a wider audience uh, when you do have it on a, on a radio or TV or whatever. Right. And, and since. Um, um, I was going to say community TV seems to be going away. Nickel candy. We're still trying to keep things going with local radio, pirate radio, and also the, the internet, which is a great boon for as long as they don't tax us into oblivion. That's true. All right, what are we talking about today? Okay, this is still on the crown, <coughs> and I had wrote, wrote this up so I could um, disperse it on the show. And uh, the crown is actually what controls the country, and in the crown. They have now the crown is not the king, to be uh, quite frank on that, <clears throat> so that the people don't think when I say the crown they're talking about the king or queen of England. What is the crown? The crown is the uh, group of men <clears throat> that uh, set together and became <clears throat> the exchequer of the king. In other words, the bankers. Uh, the money lenders and so on and so forth and uh, they have total control and part of the money lenders and the and the crown today is the Federal Reserve in this country and uh, just about any of the banks of, of any country that started is under the control of the crown because the crown is the banks or are the banks so uh, <clears throat> with that what I have to do is start out that uh, the bank, the crown, they got to have lawyers and uh, or legal people, so on and so forth, and that's what they have now. Uh, they're called the temple. So the crown has a temple, just like um, the uh, judiciary system in this country. There's lawyers, and uh, there's different types of lawyers. So in this one, <coughs> all the legalistic scams promoted by the exclusive monopoly of the temple bar and the Bar Association franchises come from the four ends or temples of the court from the Crown. They're the Inner Temple, the Middle Temple, Lincoln's Inn, and Gray's Inn. These inns or temples are exclusive and private country clubs. They're secret societies actually in the world of commerce. They're established uh, and founded early in the 1200s. And the, the Queen of England are current members of both the Inner and the Middle Temple. Gray's Inn specializes in taxation, legalities by rule and code for the Crown. And the Lincoln's Inn received its name from the third Earl of Lincoln around 1300. If you read Charles Warren's book, The History of the American Bar, you will see that he goes back to the year 1355 when bar associations became known throughout the world. That's when they finally sunk their teeth and became an entity. Now, just like all the U.S.-based franchise bar association, none of the four ends of the temple are incorporated, and for a definite reason. You can't make a claim against a non-entity and a non-being. They're private societies without characters or charters, no statutes, and all their constitutions are based solely on custom and self-regulation. In other words, they exist as secret societies without a public front door unless you're called a private called to them. Now what I did <coughs> and all your people can get this you can find out about the the middle and inner temples and so on by writing to I'll find it right here uh, writing to the American Inns of Court Foundation 127 South Payton Street, Suite 201, Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. 
And <clears throat> in the caption page, it says, The American Inns of Court Foundation is a central information source for all American Inns of Court. The Foundation Office urges you to take advantage of the member services and benefits available to your American Inn and its members. Furthermore, if you should have any questions and require more information on any aspect of American Inns of Court, please contact the Foundation Office, which I just gave you the address. Uh, I got this from uh, Everett Gaskins and Hancock and Stevens from Raleigh, North Carolina, and they uh, faxed me a copy um, for when I requested everything in there about the uh, Inns of Court in North Carolina. <coughs> so they gave me that, and then um, I went to the Secretary of State's office and uh, in 1998, and they gave me um, the... American Inns of Court Foundation in Durham, North Carolina, <coughs> and it says contributions are deductible, and it has a classification as an ed educational organization, no assets, no income amount, and the filing requirements is a Form 990 gross receipts do not exceed $25,000. A group affiliation is subordinate with a group ruling. That's all that is on the Secretary of State's office concerning the ends of court. There's one in Greensboro, North Carolina. There's one in Cary, North Carolina. And then, of course, they have the, the Bar Association <coughs> itself as an educational organization. And its principal activity, it's interesting, other instruction and training, study and research, legal aid to indigents. And the asset amount is $10 million, and the income amount is $3 million. And again, it's an independent organization or an independent auxiliary. And of course, they don't tell you this, but it comes from the British Crown. So, based on that, uh, while the Inner Temple holds the legal system's franchise to steal from Canada and Great Britain, the Middle Temple has its legal license to steal from America. This comes directly through their Bar Association franchises of the Middle Temple through the Crown Temple. Would you say that again? Who has the license in this country? Uh, <coughs> the Middle Temple okay. of the Crown. Uh, now, there's a, uh, the history of the inn, later centuries, written by the Society of the Middle Temple, you can see the direct tie to the Bar Association franchises and its Crown signatories in America. And here's a quote. <clears throat> call to the bar of keeping terms in one of the four inns is a prerequisite to call at King's Inn until late 19th century. In the 17th and 18th century, students came from the American colonies and many from the West Indian islands. The inn's records would lead one to suppose that for a time there was hardly a young gentleman in Charleston, that would be, uh, I'm assuming, South Carolina, who had not studied here. Five of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence were Middle Templars, and notwithstanding it and its consequences, America continued to come here until the War of 1812, end of quote. So that means that all licensed bar attorneys must keep the terms of their oath to the Crown Temple in order to be accepted or called to the bar at any of the King's Inns. And they have an oath and a pledge in terms of allegiance to the Crown Temple. It's not to the United States. It's not to you, not to me because we're the, the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to uh, the uh, attorneys. <clears throat> Their first uh, allegiance and duty is to the court. The second is to the public, which means a government. And the third is to you. So every one of us that hires a lawyer takes back seat to whatever it's done, and he has to go with what the judge says sitting up on the bench. That's his boss. Uh, if he tells him to shut up, he shuts up. <laughs> If he says, I'll find you in contempt of court for this, well, he knows that he's on thin ice. So, with that in, in known, <clears throat> it's a real item to know that the middle inner of the Crown Temple was publicly acknowledged that there were five Templar attorneys under solemn oath that signed the Declaration of Independence, okay? Um, so that means that both parties to the Declaration Agreement were the same origin, the Crown Temple. So, in, in if you don't understand the importance of this, then there's no international agreement or treaty that will ever be honored or will ever have lawful effect when the same party signs as both the first and second parties. 
just like the banks. They front both sides of any war. It's merely a worthless piece of paper with no lawful authority when both sides to any agreement are actually the same, and that's what it is. That's where the fraud has been pulled on the American people. So in reality, the Declaration of Independence was nothing more than the internal memo of the Crown Temple made among its private members. They're the only ones that signed it. Um, <clears throat> now, example, Alexander Hamilton, he was one of the numerous Crown Templars who was called to their bar. 1774, he entered King's College in New York City, and uh, that was funded by the London's King's Inn, now named Columbia University. In hmm. 1777, he became a personal aide and private secretary to Washington during the American Revolution. In May of 1782, Hamilton began studying law in Albany, New York, and in six months he had completed a three-year course of studies. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah. He passed his examinations and was admitted to the New York Bar. Of course, New York Bar Association was and is the franchise of the Crown Temple through the Middle End. The New York, uh, the, I, the New York Bar? Yes. In fact, New York has a total uh, different aspect than any other city in the, in the country, uh, and it's really the seat of all the power because of the Crown. Does that... Now, again, I, I know I'm bad about this, so if you would just okay. answer this and then get back to where you were going, because I, I know I take you down roads uh, other than the direction in which you wish to go. <clears throat> but um, is there any kind of, is it a coincidence that the New York Bar would have the power it does in the United States and that also the, the New York Res Federal Reserve Bank also is the, uh, the biggest 700-pound uh, gorilla in the country? Yeah, and that's why all the other things that happen in there, Wall Street and, and whatnot, because <clears throat> that particular part of it, uh, you can find that in Charles Warren's book, The History of the American Bar. There are certain sections on that that are on ATG Press if they go to it and look at the American Bar. And you can read excerpts from Charles Warren's book in there. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> What happened was, in 1783, the session, he settled down to practice in New York City as Alexander Hamilton Esquire. In February of 1784, he wrote the charter for and became the founding member of the Bank of New York. That's the state's first bank. Now, you see, that wasn't the state's, that was the state's first bank, but it wasn't the state of New York bank. It was private. They just... Hey, we'll set up a bank in New York. We'll call it the first bank of New York. All right, so there was, no, there was nothing, state of, no, nothing state about it except the title. Right, that's okay. all. Okay. So um, he secured a place in New York delegation of the Federal Convention in 1787 in Philly, and he gave a five-hour speech on June 18th. <laughs> and it was titled, An Executive for Life Will Be an Elective Monarch. That's a quote. An executive of the... Executive for life will be an elective monarch. But what, what does he refer to when he when he says executive? Um, the president. <clears throat> In other words, the president of the uh, United States would be a monarch, and that's what Patrick Henry. If you go read in this the Virginia debate, 1787, he says it squinched towards monarchy, hmm. and that's why none of the anti-federalists would go for it. Uh, so. Um, what happened was, uh, when he signed uh, the Constitution for the United States representing New York State, that was one of the Crown's legal states, because it was a colony at the time. So, um, <clears throat> what happened was, a lot of people don't realize this, but Alexander Hamilton uh, was of Jewish descent and black. His father was uh, Levine. And he changed his name before he went to the island of Nuevas. That's where they ended up. There's a big uh, plaque down there and a big monument for Alexander Hamilton. And he changed his name <coughs> to Hamilton, came to West Indies, and married a mulatto named Rachel Fawcett. And then they had Hamilton. Hamilton went over back to be gleaned in Europe through the crown to be the front man into the United States that they knew was going to be created so that he could bring in the first bank. 
That's that simple. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, let's just try to think. Um, what, what he did was when he came back, we all know the duel between Burr and, and Hamilton, and uh, the reason why that was is because Burr kept chiding Hamilton of being a black Jew all the time. And it just got to him so much that that's what perpetrated the duel. And, of course, history shows that uh, Hamilton was killed by Burr. If I could ask you about something with regard to that feud. Uh -huh. had, Burr, had Burr defeated Hamilton in any kind of political situation? Did he win? Um, I don't even know if they were in the same party. But Burr obviously was vice president to Jefferson, correct? Right. Did, uh, did Hamilton... Um, aspire to that office? No, no. He was <coughs> strictly made the Secretary of Treasury. Hmm. Okay. Um, I have to tell you, I lived uh, about 500 feet above where they uh, they dueled on the shore of the Hudson. Oh, yeah? Uh, long story short, I mean, it was one of the places I lived. Uh, it's Weehawk in, in Hudson County, New Jersey. Yeah. And um, as, as the, the story has it, uh, Hamilton made a fatal mistake. I don't know uh -huh. if you read this or not, but uh, when he won the toss, he decided which way to uh, to pace off. Right. And he chose to pace off towards the mainland, which down there in Weehawken uh, has the famous Jersey Palisades. Right. Sheer rock walls, right? Uh -huh. well, well, yeah. you know, you know the neighborhood. Yeah. Right. Um, well, you know, he walks to the uh, to the to the, the Palisades, and what happens is he turns around with a beautiful backdrop behind him to frame him up as a target. And he looks into the glinting sun coming up over <laughs> over the east. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you might want to have rethought that, Alex. <laughs> but uh, but honestly, the two of them were rather sinister characters, weren't they? And it was and they kind of canceled each other out. Right. All right. Interesting. Well, <clears throat> okay. What happened was Washington uh, elected Hamilton as a U.S. Treasury, and he alone laid the foundation for the first. Federal U.S. Central Bank secured credit loans through the Crown Banks in France and the Netherlands and increased the power of the federal government over the hoodwinked nations of the Union. They had no idea. Hamilton never made it a secret of the fact that he admired the government and fiscal policies of Great Britain. Yep. Americans were fooled into believing that the legal Crown colonies compromising New England were independent nation states, but they never they never were, and, never, and they aren't today. They were, and still are, colonies of the Crown Temple through letters, patent, and charters. And they don't have no legal authority to be independent from the rule and order of the Crown Temple. The legal state is the Crown Temple colony. And that's why the New York City became the Crown Temple's jump-off point and their base of operation, and that's why they're still there today. So, the people of America, Queen of England, Britain, they don't own America. And the Crown Temple owns America through the deception of all those who swore an allegiance to the Middle and Templar Bar. The Crown Bankers and the Middle Templar Attorneys ruled through America all the contracts, all the unlawful taxes, and all the contract documents of false equity through debt and deceit and they're all strictly enforced by their completely unlawful but legal orders, rules, and codes of the Crown Temple. So our so-called judiciary in America <coughs> is none other than Crown Temple pawns. Did, did you find anything where anybody resisted this or was very, very uh, vocal? Uh, no. And the reason why is it was so much of a fraud and so big that uh, the people just didn't get it. They didn't know what was going on. Well, let me just stop you right there. What you just said, is that not exactly the condition in which we find ourselves right now? Exactly, yes. Because the people see all this Patriot Act being put out there and all these other things that are going on, Homeland Security, and they ain't complaining. In fact, they're jumping on the bandwagon and say, oh, we need more of it. I'll give up more of my liberties just to be safe. And well, 
they have given up so much of their liberties that they ain't safe. But here again, if you can make something big enough, it, it's everybody thinks a conspiracy or or some some plan has to be small, you know, minute. Right. But the no, thing it, is, it can be right. such a big thing, and you know. Mm-hmm. You tell a lie long enough, everybody believes it. But actually, the bigger it is, the better. Because if you're in, if you're in an elevator with a with an with an elephant, you really probably don't know what you got yourself into. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Now, oh, well, let's go back to 1776. Here's an old Latin maxim and Roman expression: Whoever owns the soil owns all the way to the heavens and depths of the earth. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, in 1776, <laughs> that's what, like, Roosevelt and the, and the World War, the bombing, is, is <laughs> that will truly live in Im- infamy right. for all Americans. That's the year the Crown Colonies became Crown States. All right, the Declaration of Independence was legal, wasn't lawful. It was signed by both sides of the representatives of the Crown Temple legally announced the status quo of the Crown Colonies to that of the new legal name called States as direct possessive estates of the Crown. That's why I had mentioned earlier in the last show, see the definitions to understand the legal trickery that was done. So the American people right then was hoodwinked into thinking they were declaring lawful independence from the Crown. The proof that the colonies were still in Crown possession is use of the word state to signify a, quote, legal estate of possession, end quote. In other words, if you go back and look up estate, you will find even in Black's Law Dictionary that it is now taken on the term state. All right. Had this been a document of and by the people, both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution would have been written using the word state. By use of state, the significance of a government of an estate possession was legally established. You go back in uh, again and look in um, uh, the 1780, 1788 Virginia debates when Patrick Henry said, "What?" I'm, I'm paraphrasing now because I don't have the exact thing in front of me. Uh, what right do you have, talking to the the uh, commission, to say we the people? when it should be we the states and he said that twice in there and anybody can pick up the I think it was June 4th to the 8th in the Virginia debates of 1788 and you can pick it up maybe it might be on the internet I don't know but you'll see in there exactly what he said so all the constitutional rights are simply dictated by the crown temple and enforced by the middle temple which are bar attorneys, through the franchise and corporate government entity, a.k.a. the federal United States government. Now, when a state citizen, and I'll put that in capitals, attempts to invoke his constitutional, natural, or common law rights in chantry, their equity courts, he is told they don't apply. We all know that. Why? Simply because a state citizen has no rights outside the rule and codes of the crown law, because... Only a state citizen has natural common law rights by a paramount authority of God. Now, it might sound confusing. I just use state citizen two different ways. Mm. It's the capitalization that does it. So, um, the people that compromise the citizenry of the state are recognized only within natural and common law as already established. That'd be God's law. Only a state citizen, now I capitalize it, can be a party to an action within a state court. A common state citizen, I'm going to say, instead of state citizen inhabitant, cannot be recognized in that court because he doesn't legally exist in Crown Chancery courts. In order to be recognized by the state courts, a common man must be converted to a corporate entity. That's why they have a legal fiction called a person. And you go and look in um, the informer site and look up person and that is the best definition that I could find from legal sources of what a person is and a person is not in law the physical man so now you know why 
They created the entity using all capital letters within birth certificates issued by the state. They convert the common lawful man to a person of a fictional legal entity subject to administration by state rules, orders, and codes. All right, because there's in there's no law within any rule or code. It's not a law. It's just a rule. Of course, rules and codes don't apply to the lawful man of the Lord, if you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but he must be converted to a legal person of fictional status because they're a fiction to begin with and fictions can only deal with other fictions they can't deal with a man a physical state Are that you, he's in so you can't cross there's no there's no interrelationship between the two right That that's at least recognized right okay. nothing is recognized <clears throat> so the chantry courts are the crown courts where the decisions of so called justice are decided by three judges uh, it's a direct result of the Crown Temple having invoked the rule and code over all judicial courts. Every judicial court in this country is not anything to do with this country. It's done with the Crown. It's held, held by the Crown. Here's a quote. It is held to be a settled rule that our courts cannot take notice of any title to land not derived from the state or colonial government and duly verified by patent. Four John's Rep. 163, Jackson v. Walters, 12 Johns, Rep. 365, SP. So, the Crown Temple granted letters patent and charters for all the land and all the colonies of New England, and the King of England, a sworn member of the Middle Temple, as the Queen is now, since the people were giving their patent charter corporations, the governor's of the colonies had a hard time especially concerning the crown taxation and the scheme was devised to allow the Americans to believe they were granted independence remember the crown templars represented presented both parties at the 1776 declaration and not only there but to the treaty of peace every one of them was an esquire that signed it so you got one party signing both sides, don't you? Uh-huh. Is that legal? Uh, if they say it is. Yeah, they say it is, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's under conquest. They that's make why the, they yeah, say it is. Right, they make the laws of it. Now, the reason they had that declaration was recognized by international treaty law in order to establish the new legal crown entity of the incorporated United States Middle Templar King George the Third agreed to in the Treaty of Paris. Quote, between the crown of Great Britain and said United States. Well, wait a minute. The crown of Great Britain is the same as the crown of the United States. So there's the agreement right there that is totally a total fraud. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, most important is the actual signatories of the Treaty of Paris. Like I said, they were all esquires. So... Um, this legally signifies officers of the king's court, which are now known as Templar courts or crown courts. So this is the same crown Templar title given to Alexander Hamilton. So the David Hartley, he was a middle Templar of the king's court representing the United States. John Adams, Ben Franklin, and John Jay. They were all the signatories for the United States. And we're also Middle Templars of the Crown's Court through the Bar Association. Plainly written in history proves again the Crown Temple was representing both parties to the agreement. Perfect and elaborate scam, huh? How are the American people ever going to know this? They don't. They, they, They don't go into research like we do and find out. They have no idea this is sitting in the background controlling them. Now, now you, you, when you, you mentioned Patrick Henry's um, opposition to such. Right. It, was there was there a sizable number of people involved in government in that day? Oh yeah, there, yeah. There was. Uh, um, if you if you get stories, um, anti-federalist. It's called the anti-federalist, and it's edited by Herbert Storing. And it's a really good book. It's a complete anti-federalist book. 
and <coughs> um, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Maryland, Virginia, and New York are all represented in here. It also gives the speeches of Patrick Henry in the Virginia State Ratifying Convention, that's 1788. And um, they have, uh, oh, numerous. Agrippa is one of them from Massachusetts. Uh, they wrote. Uh, another one was uh, the minority of the convention. They all called themselves different names at the time. Then there's the essays. Um, there is uh, the Pennsylvania. And what happened in, in one of the Pennsylvanians, and, and also the letters called the Federal Farmer, um, there was um, a big hullabaloo because they said, <laughs> Uh, Pennsylvania couldn't get down to the convention and they already passed everything without them being there. So, um, in the Pennsylvania, called the Minority Convention, it says, I'm quoting right out of Storings, the Congress might gloss over this conduct by construing every purpose for which the state legislatures now lay taxes to be for the general welfare and therefore as of their jurisdiction. And the supremacy laws of the United States is established by Article 6. And it goes on and talks about it and says, As there are no articles of taxation reserved to the state governments, Congress may monopolize every source of revenue and thus indirectly demolish the state governments. Well, they've done that now. For without funds, they could not exist. The taxes, duties, and excises imposed by Congress may be so high as to render it impractical to levy further sums on the same articles. But whether this should be the case or not, if the state government should presume to impose taxes duties on the same articles with Congress, the latter may abrogate and repeal the laws whereby they are imposed upon the allegation. Now, this is those people knew at the time, and they were coming in and saying all this happy stuff was going to happen, and it was not right. But the average American people, just like the average American people today, they could care less. They weren't involved. They, they didn't want to get involved. They just wanted to make their life and go on and get what they could and have all their worldly possessions that they had. And, you know, they weren't worried about how government men who was taking over um, <coughs> and, and ruling their lives, you know, to infinity. Now, this, this happened under uh, Jefferson's watch. Is that true? No, this was under Washington. Washington, okay. Yeah. But yeah, because this was October 12th, 1787. Okay, right. And Jefferson wouldn't come around until the turn of the century. Yeah. All right. And it said um, in, in, in their thing, he's saying, Dear Sir, and he goes in and says, It is to be observed that when the people shall adopt a proposed constitution, it will be their last and supreme act. It will be adopted not by the people of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, etc., but by the people of the United States. See? Right there, they're telling you that they knew that the people, the common man in the states, had nothing to do with the Constitution creation, ratification, or whatever. And it was never ratified anyway. <clears throat> There's a Marxist, um, and despite the fact that he is such, wrote a, um, a book called Toward an American Revolution. Uh huh. And um, his name is Frisia, F R E I S A. And, uh -huh. and, you know, he had some points which I had to take into consideration, despite the fact that he thinks maybe Marxism is the answer. But, it, you know, he called it an elitist document. Would you agree with, with those terms? He called the what? He called the Constitution an elitist document. Yeah, that's what it was. Right. It was created by the elite people <coughs> who were the signers. <laughs> the people didn't sign it. It was only those people who had um, money and uh, they had uh, the power and they actually owned land in Europe, Great Britain, France. Well, could you comment then, though, on the Bill of Rights? I mean, I think that is exceptional. How does that fit in with the whole idea of their... The Bill of Rights, all right, the Bill of Rights was strictly for the United States. It was strictly for those people and not the common inhabitants of those. There was 207 inhabitants in the area called the United States or Washington, D.C., what it is now. In other words... If you go and read the John Barron case, <coughs> you will see that the Chief Justice comes right out and says that the Bill of Rights was not made for the people of the states because they, those states had their own Bill of Rights, 
and it was only for the United States. And uh, that's all the way up to the present year 2000 when I studied it, and I found a book on constitutional law that goes through every case that was brought up, which was never been overturned, the John Barron case. Well, when you, when you say it's only for the United States, are you are you defining the United States as you did before? Washington, D.C. That's it. Okay. The United States is actually Congress assembled. They, okay, so, so in other words, they, they granted themselves yes. these rights. They granted themselves that, that Bill of Rights, not the average common man on the street. And so they just indemnified them against certain kind of, uh, I guess, uh, 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 dictatorial powers and such, but the, but the rest of the people, uh, as you and I are, uh, right. we swung in the wind. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Yeah. And still do to this day. Uh huh, still are, yeah. That's why uh, they say uh, don't bring in the constitutional rights. Oh, uh, when you bring in. See, what they did, how they brought in the Bill of Rights into the states is under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. That's how they started to bring it in. And uh, the case, the book, <coughs> probably have to go to the library and get it. It is The Cases in Constitutional Law, the third edition, by Robert E. Cushman and Robert F. Cushman. It is um, <coughs> Appleton, Appleton Century Cross. And... Um, It'll give you all the cases in constitutional law, and I'll give you the Library of Congress card number is 68-18704. The last time it was copyrighted was 1967. Okay. And uh, <coughs> they have, in the John Barron case, I'll open that, I just have, have it here. It said... Um, <coughs> I tell you what, I mean, hold on a second for that. Right at that point, because I tell you, we haven't really done any business. I want to tell everybody, this is the Grassy Knoll. With us is the informers. Uh, you can go to the website, atgpress.com, and you'll find his writings. And let's talk about that now, because you do have uh, certain uh, publications for uh, purchase, do you not? Yes. Okay, and um, I'm going to that right now. Now, just to clarify, you do have one volume of Which One Are You that is out of print. Right. Uh, and I think you've addressed it before, but I'll ask you to do it again. Everything else is available. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and, and also, folks, he's asked very specifically about how to purchase such. And you had said that if anybody just puts in a notation on the money order or inside a letter that um, you heard this on a radio show, that you would, what, give them 10% off the total? Right. Right. Okay. All right, anything else that you want to alert people to that um, uh, you have <coughs> under your name on that site? Uh, no, that's about it. The other site is just right after mine is uh, James just, Montgomery, right. and that will go a lot more into the um, uh, the crown <coughs> and because he, he is doing a lot of the research in that, and I let him do that. And I just kept on going on the taxes and the rest of the history and, you know, putting it together. But uh, Montgomery is an excellent uh, researcher on that. In fact, I, I emailed you something over yes. the other day on yeah. that. If you do go to the homepage of atgpress.com, uh, which stands for Against the Grain, uh, you can read, read his works. Uh, if you click on the link uh, stated as Knowledge is Freedom, which is the upper one on the right-hand column, and um, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but just off the top of your head, do you know uh, whether uh, James has in the past or was willing perhaps to do some uh, some interviews? I don't know. I, he was over here, <coughs> and um, uh, as I said, he was a truck driver, <coughs> and he's been put off of the road because he's got high sugar, <laughs> and they can't drive oh. with high sugar. Let's see. Ooh. So uh, right now, until he gets the sugar under control, he's sitting home, and uh, that's the reason why he came up for a visit. And um, I briefly mentioned to him about the radio show, and as long as he's home, I think maybe he just might. All right, excellent. And I would ask you to, to broker that if you could, and I'll sure. follow up yeah. on your directions. Thank you very much for doing that. Okay. Now back to business. You were about to read to us. Okay, the Baron versus Baltimore. That is seven Peters. 243, 8 Lawyers Edition, 672, 
it's an 1833 case. All right. <coughs> um, Chief Justice John Marshall delivered the opinion of the court. Here's one of the things he said. The Constitution was ordained and established by the people of the United States for themselves, for their own government, and not for the government of the individual states. Each state established the Constitution for itself, and in that Constitution provided such limitations and restrictions on the powers of its particular government as its judgment dictated. The people of the United States framed such a government for the United States as they supposed best adapted to their situation and best uh, calculated to promote their interests. Now that says a lot. And in here it said, um, <clears throat> it's worthy to remark too that these inhibitions generally restrain state legislation on subjects entrusted to the general government or in which the people of all the states feel an interest. Now, what they're talking about there is the ex post facto law and the ninth section, restriction on state regulation, which was no state shall, uh, blah, 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 blah. That's the only other part. Now, um, when they come down, see, John Barron uh, was in Maryland, and when the government did something in his... In, in their wharf there, <clears throat> they created a situation where, uh, in paving the streets of Baltimore, it diverted their streams and everything, and the sand and gravel was deposited near Barron's Wharf. So he uh, sued them out, and the decision in, Bal in the Barron said, has left an indelible possession, impression on the development of civil rights. While today Barron would have bought his case under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, the process of change by which parts of the Bill of Rights have come to be applicable to the states has been slow, uncertain, and confusing. While most rights in the Bill of Rights now do apply to the states, they do so only because they are essential to due process of law. Therefore, when anybody comes in and institutes the Bill of Rights, you know what they say. <laughs> Don't bring that up in my court. But do you find that, you know, I wasn't paying any attention, you know, before 2000. But even since that time that I have been paying attention, it seems that these complaints come up more and more often. Now, is that just a, a, a flaw in my observation? or No, it, it's been there. Um, well, I, I don't know if you say a flaw in your observation, but <clears throat> if you don't follow the cases like we do, uh, you wouldn't know. And um, there's, oh, gee, I don't know how many cases that come back, and I, I have them on my computer. And I wrote an article, I think, on that, uh, on the Constitutional. I don't know if it's on HEG Press or not, but <laughs> I do have it. It's quite lengthy, and it goes through every case that I dug up on the John Barron and you can shepherdize the John Barron case and you, you can follow all the cases all the way up and go to the library and pull every one of them and uh, it's right there okay. and, and it just every one of the cases says it has not been overturned to this day and the last case I saw was the year 2000 hmm. so uh, <clears throat> right there when you look at the term United States, all it means is doing business as, or a.k.a. Congress. Because it says, Congress assembled in the United States. And the same way as the President, when he's announced, he's announced the President of the United States is not the President of the United States of America. Because if that were to happen, he would have to okay every one of the 50 governors' legislation. He'd be the top man it would go through. But he's not. He is the President of the United States. You just look on TV, whenever he's announced, not the President of the United States of America. He's the President of the United States. But then what does that say about the relationship to the states then? That says that the states, at one time, were supposedly, or this is what the myth is, independent. But they're not, because remember, the Crown Temple owns them all. Even the United States. Even the Maryland and Virginia, which turned over part of their property 
or state to the Congress was still all owned by the Crown Temple. You know, you know, I looked up that definition of state in um, in Blacks. Uh huh. You know, I had that sixth edition, which we talked about in that last show. Oh, okay. But you know what's interesting too, uh, and, and this goes back to the notion of what a state was prior to the Civil War. Uh-huh. And it describes it as uh, being capable of entering into international relations with other communities of the globe. Yeah. Now, why would that happen when a state was supposed to be uh, <coughs> forbidden in the United States Constitution to attack piracy on the high seas and all this other stuff, and that it couldn't create or, or start a war with an, a foreign country? Well, simply because... They're all owned by the Crown Temple. So they can do whatever they want. Hmm. So in other words, in one sense, they were allowed to do commerce. Right. But they could not do, uh, I guess, battle or... Uh, right. They couldn't uh, declare war against France. New York couldn't declare war against France. It would have to be the United States declare the war against France. And uh, Florida couldn't... Um, stop someone on the high seas for piracy. It would have to be the United States. And, and, and the state only went out three miles, and the United States went out as far as the international boundaries would let it go. All right, so the, so the United States went from that three-mile um, uh, demarcation point to the international waters. Right. Uh, we don't even know about that today, though, do we? No. Nope. We don't even look at three miles belonging to, the, to a particular state, do we? No. Nope. Okay. People have no idea. Okay. So, uh, now, <coughs> okay, let's get back to, uh, when you read Article 5, uh, it says, to provide for the restitution of all estates, rights, and properties which have been cos- confiscated belonging to real British subjects, end quote. That means the Crown Colonies were granted to persons and corporations of the Crown Temple through letters, patent, and charters, and the North American colonial land was owned by the Crown. The catch-all is in Article 4. It is agreed that creditors on either side shall meet with no lawful impediment to the recovery of the full value of sterling money of all bona fide debts heretofore contracted. Okay. So that means that since the Crown and its Templars represented both the United States as debtors and the Crown as the creditors, then they became the creditor of the American people by owing, owning all the debts of the former colonies, now called the legal crown states. Now, sounds too good to be true, but <laughs> the word scam and hoodwink can't begin to describe what is taking place. Hmm. So, what debts were owed by the Crown Temple and their banks as of 1883 in the contract between the King and the 13 United States of North America signed in Versailles, July 16, 1782, in Article 1, here's what it states, It is agreed and certified that the sum advanced by His Majesty to the Congress of the United States under the title of a loan in the years 1778, 79, 80, 81, and the present 1782 amounts to the sum of 18 million of livres money of France, according to following 21 receipts of the above-mentioned underwritten Minister of Congress given in virtue of his powers to win. That's a quote. Now you know where the the, the money is still owed. It's never. It's infinite. It will never drop off. That amount equals to $18 million plus interest that Hamilton's U.S. Central Bank owed the Crown through the Crown Bank loans of France. And this was signed, remember, by Benjamin Franklin, who was the middle Templar of the Crown. But, but that was a contract with France. Yeah, there was a contract with France. Yeah, because who else is that co-signed by? Do you remember who the French dignitary was? No, I didn't get that. But <clears throat> an additional $6 million of dollars was loaned to the United States at 5% interest on February 25th, 1783. So the Crown bankers in the Netherlands and France were calling in their debt for payment by the future generations, us. And that's how it's been ever oh. since. That's why uh, you'll see... Uh, in the IMF, you have a uh, BMF code, business master file, for all considered a business, uh, and it's a 
lock, docket code 300, and that is U.S. Treaty Great Britain uh, money owed to it. It's right there. All right, so you're saying to this day, and I guess in, uh, in perpetuity, that we will be in servitude to actually the bankers, right? Yeah, to the crown. To the right. crown, but not only the crown of Great Britain is what you just said. Are we looking now also at France and the Netherlands? Oh yeah, yeah, because that's that becomes if you look at the concession of England to the Pope, May fifteenth at twelve fifteen, that's when the charter of the fealty of the King John to the Pope Innocent and the Roman Church was witnessed before the Crown Templars as King John stated when he sealed it, he says, quote, I myself bearing witness to the house of the Knights Templars. Mm-hmm. End quote. So, and John was a sovereign of, of, of England. Yeah. Yeah. So the particular words that they use there, especially charter, fealty, demure, and concession, they're all really, that's why I say it's very important to know what the definitions of the words actually mean, not what they're presumed to mean or what you think they mean. Or it's what they've totally come different. to mean, yeah. yeah. Yes. Now, if you go and look in uh, the informer site under terms, not words, you'll find that if you pick up the Internal Revenue Code and you go back to the definitions, 7701A, every one of those definitions starts the term da 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 right there clues you in that it is not the word means this it's the term means this and term and word is so much different like night and day that you wouldn't believe it though most people they have no idea they they think a word is a term and term is a word it's well, not let me do this if you don't mind for those who are listening right now, whether or not they're on your site. But real quick, how you have broken it down from Black's, I guess, fourth edition. Uh-huh. The term is a word or phrase, an expression, particularly one which possesses a fixed or known meaning in some science, art, or profession. And then underneath that you have words, symbols indicating idea and subject to contraction and expansion to meet the idea sought to be expressed. As used in law, this term generally signifies the technical terms and phrases appropriate to particular instruments or aptly fitted to the expression of a particular intention in legal instruments. And then to see the subtitles following. Um, if you could capsulize that for us, can you give us an example even of what would be a term and what would be a word, even if it's the same word or term? Um, okay. Um, they have to say it's a term or a word in the statute. And that's where they do. So then you can take a word, which you'll find in the dictionary. You can go, oh, uh, let's say uh, capitulate. You go to a Webster's Dictionary or any other dictionary and you look up the word capitulate. That is the average meaning that the average person knows it to be. Now you take capitulate and you say uh, the term capitulate, and then you define it. That means that you have now taken the standard dictionary, throw it away, and look at what the statute definition is. Just like when you go and look at the the term United States in the uh, Internal Revenue Code, and it will define it how they want it defined, and that's why they use term. That means that term is limiting. It cannot include anything else. That is why there's so much argument is the word includes and including, and everybody argues this and that and what it means, but if the word term is in there, you can say term limits the use of what they're defining, and therefore it does not include and cannot include other things within the meaning. All right. As I'm looking at this, and now it's just hit me, duh, um... What we're, when it ends, uh, when that term definition ends, uh-huh. uh, in your website it says, in some science, art, or profession. So now I'm thinking as we all talk about how certain industries and businesses have their own lexicon. Right. So what they've done with term is, when you, you take a word, but then when you want to, uh, let's say, 
a habit have a designation specifically to what you're doing, whatever that should be, whether it's the law, as it says, science, art, that's where it changes, isn't it? Yes, that's it's, where it changes. It, it, all right, you're taking some kind of word, but you're saying, okay, in this particular field, it has this designation. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, Just like when they say domestic and foreign in uh, 7701A, I think it's 3 and 4, <coughs> all right, uh, domestic means to the United States where the law is written. Foreign means to the states out in the Union. <laughs> and then when they say a corporation, you know, it's a domestic corporation, just like Bruce Shaver. Okay, let's look at that case. I'm going to stop right here because I know we probably don't have much longer to go. Yeah, we only coming up on uh, three minutes. Okay. Um, uh, Bruce Shaver lived in Kings County. I have all the documents from Kings County, New York, and worked as a clerk, but that was to New York. That's foreign. So when he had stock in the uh, Union Pacific Railroad, the United States owned it. That is a domestic corporation. He had stock in a domestic corporation, was a foreign entity, and had to pay the amount of money that the IRS said he had to pay because it was a domestic corporation and he was a foreign stockholder. It's that simple. But to the average person listening to this, it's like, huh, what? Well, you've got to understand the words and terms. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that gives another whole slant, even a, a deepening of the uh, term uh, legalese. Right. All right. Uh, we're talking with um, with Iman. He's the informer. You can go to uh, atgpress.com. That stands for Against the, uh, the Grain. And you'll find his writings, and that's where I'm at right now, as he's talking about terms and not words and such. And um, I don't know. How do we do today as far as uh, the goal that you set for covering information? Well, let me see. Um, <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> I'm down on page 6, and I've got to go to uh, page 13. So we covered half of it. <laughs> well, I tell you what. I know it's painstaking, and you are being such, because it is important to be precise. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful, and I know the listeners are, for, for you to do this. Um, one last thing, if you could, as we close out. Can you, if you have it at hand... One more uh, take on, on the address of the American Inns of Court. Can you give it that again? Oh, okay. The American Inns of Court. Uh, let me get it right here. Uh, okay, it's American Inns of Court Foundation, 127 South Peyton Street, P-E-Y-T-O-N, Suite 201, Alexandria, Virginia, 2234, uh, sorry, 22314, and uh, you'll get their introduction and their blurb of what it's supposed to be. Read it with a grain of salt because they're telling the myth of what they are when they're really not. 